Well, hello, friends. Now, welcome to the Pirate Round. I be Captain Scaltipus, and this be the Scarlet Raven. And as we do every time on the Pirate Round, we start our episode off with some toasts to our friends. And uh, these be friends now who are not here with us anymore, and friends who we've yet to meet, and friends we wish were here, and friends we miss dearly, and friends we've lost, and friends we've lost. And we say to you, your heart, your heart, welcome to the pirate round. Mm. And that's smooth. So now you might be looking at this and wondering, well, has the captain and the captain lost their mind? Have they started their own grocery business? <laughs> but captain, you know, I think we have. <laughs> well, you know, and there'd be a good reason for it. But first, let me uh, relate a tale to you. Now, it wasn't that long ago that the captain and I had grounded our ship upon the shores of Larkspurshire. And Larkspurshire be an inland area that we had grounded our, sh our ship upon to visit the festival there. It, fi it sits at about 6,500 feet. That's quite up there, you know, quite high in the mountains. And as we were, as the captain and I were walking along, well, a rather odd, kind of uh, ruffious-looking gentleman uh, walked up to us and said, Hey, scurvy pirates! Well, I can't believe it, what he said to us. Scurvy pirates, indeed. And I thought... I still got all my teeth. Well, I'll tell you what. I thought Captain Scarlet Raven was going to skewer his, li his liver. And I had to restrain her at the time to keep her from, screw from skewering his liver. You may be mad. Because Call I'll tell you what. Pirate. Scurvy pirates. And I'll tell you, scurvy's nothing to play around with, as you're going to see in this episode entitled Scurvy Dog. Scurvy Dog. Which is a funny thing because dogs can't get scurvy. No, they can't. It's interesting that we start out and say that there are very few animals on this world that actually cannot make a defense against scurvy. Humans being one, guinea pigs another, and there is one other. I don't know. But the guinea pig, the guinea pig is the other one that I know. But True. we will do a little research and we will be putting putting it down below. True. But those are the two that that uh, have a problem with vitamin C, which is a uh, a key thing in preventing scurvy. It is true that way. Now, amazingly enough. Scurvy did not uh, find its cure until really into the early 1800s. Truth. But for a long time, uh, mariners who had sailed the oceans, uh, some of them uh, not uh, associated with directly with the military, had known that when they fed their uh, crews uh, certain fresh fruits and vegetables, while well, even if they were sick, they would perk right back up. And they may not have made the uh, actual connection between that, but eventually began, some of them began to realize, well, I don't know how this is working, but you know, if I feed my crew some better food, well, they seem to get well, and they seem to get better, and uh, they become more productive. Now, pirates didn't have the problem of scurvy so much as the, the British Navy, or the English Navy, the French, the Dutch, and the, uh, the Spanish, because pirates typically weren't out to seas for a long time. They would go on board onto shores and, and uh, scavenge. So they didn't have the, uh, the lack of food or fresh food. Now they didn't have as much food as a Navy ship. So therefore they had to stay closer onto uh, to the shores to, uh, to get fresh fruit and fresh foods and things like that. 
And some of the things that the pirates did, uh, it, it set them apart from other mariners being one, they would often spend more time uh, on the coast, uh, carousing as it were, uh, with the locals and eating local foods, which quite often consisted of fresh fruit and vegetables and things of that sort, fresh meats. Also, and when they did make their long voyages across the ocean, from say the Caribbean over to Africa, well, you know, when they did grab a ship, they would take the best of what the ship had, meaning the officers' foods and the best wines. That's right. And they would drink that <coughs> and eat those things. And as we know uh, from reading a great deal about scurvy, while it was typically the lower ranks in the seamen who suffered the most, and the officers, because they ate so much better and ate fresher fruit and vegetables, didn't suffer so much in many cases, although not all cases. Now, many crew on board a naval ship had been press ganged. And the sad thing is, is most press ganged uh, sailors had uh, no experience. And... Uh, it only only those that had influence or wealth, and, and sometimes even those that had influence and wealth were press ganged wrongly. And so many of them had, there were spindly leg land lovers who, uh, who were vagrants and tramps and criminals who were already pretty low in physical health and, and uh, were sick and malnutrished and, uh, or even elderly. So when they got press ganged onto a, a ship, then it became even more so. That's true. And you've got to understand now that, say, three, four hundred years ago, when you think about ships, they were just as class conscious and as class leveled as society was itself. And the lower ranks tended to be the poor people of the earth who couldn't get away from the press gangs and who were trying to escape a life of poverty. And they would set sail upon ships trying to seek their fortunes in a new land, perhaps, or at least to get a, a steady meal every day. Uh, in in exchange for some very hard work. However, uh, many of these peasant folk, you know, could be starving to death on land and still working just as hard. Or but, harder. Or harder. And there's been many accounts of men, you know, who would dive over, dive over the side of a merchant ship where they were being slowly starved to death by their officer and swim over to a Navy ship and offer themselves, regardless of the, of the uh, situation, regard, uh, regardless of the conditions aboard that ship, and offer themselves to the naval officer and say, well, I'm your man now, uh, at least give me three squares a day in me grog, and I'll do anything you wish, because anything is better than starving, either on land or in a, or in a merchant ship. But then you had the crew that uh, might be so unlucky as they go into a tavern, they they get their uh, their drink, they finish their drink, and there's a coin in the bottom, and they think, oh, lucky me, I've got the coin, and they take that coin, they walk out the door of the tavern, and they get jumped. Because the press king says, well, you took the coin, you took the payment. You took the king's coin, friend, and then you taken it away. That's in exchange for your freedom for the next four years. So, you know, typically on board, the sickly um, or unhealthy were, were only, only good enough for hauling ropes or, or uh, swabbing the deck. But uh, as, you know, crews went uh, f uh, longer cruises, then those who were sickly um, couldn't really do much at all. No, they couldn't. Now, you know, a typical typical person on board a ship had a lot of diseases and sicknesses that, uh, that they might encounter. Um, you know, things like thiamine deficiency, which would cause uh, beriberi, uh, vitamin A, which could uh, cause night blindness, um, niacin deficiency, which could have uh, caused lunacy and convulsions, uh, diseases such as syphilis, uh, malaria, rickets, smallpox, tuberculosis, yellow fever, and uh, many other things like venereal diseases and many things like that. And not to mention that just be malnutrition, of course. Malnutrition. And that not those people of the lower classes not being able to feed themselves with the adequate amounts of, of fresh vegetables and fruits and maybe uh, forced to subsist on some sort of boiled wheat gruel that they could eat every day that uh, didn't quite provide them with enough uh, nutrition. Right. Now, the, the, the odors on a ship could be quite foul, and especially on board a French or a Spanish ship, which were the Catholic ships, because they didn't believe in throwing their dead into the water like the English or the Dutch. They would stick them down in the holds, and then they would rot, and, and the stench would be horrible. 
then you added in the things like rotten cheese, which could actually cause a, a gaseous that was just foul and, and, and horrible. And there, were, there was a long time belief that scurvy was caused from bad air. Bad vapors, they bad say. Bad vapors. Yes, bad it, vapors. It was also believed by uh, some upper, upper uh, physicians that uh, scurvy was caused by uh, delinquency, not being, you know, being lazy and not working hard instead of the food. Not working hard enough. Uh, and typically, that's an upper class idea that, oh, these poor folks aren't working hard enough. Drive them harder with the whip. And either you'll cure them or you'll kill them. Right. And it doesn't really matter what you do. After all, they're just peasants anyway. And goodness gracious, wouldn't anyone want to become a pirate in the face of something like that? That's right. Now, a typical food that a pirate, or not a pirate, but a, a, a Navy diet could have would be biscuit, one pound daily. Now, it wasn't that the kind of biscuits you're thinking that your ma used to make. These nice golden no. fluffy biscuits that you slather honey and jam and butter upon. No. This be a biscuit that is sort of like a cracker, sort of like a pounded out dried cracker. Uh, the only way you could possibly drink it was to soak it in water, usually salt water, for a few minutes before you tried to swallow it. Otherwise, you couldn't get it down. It was so hard. And a lot of times it was it was covered in weevils, and the weevils would, would actually go through and, and burrow holes so it would just be, become dust. And there was actually a name for a weevil, a weevil that they called it, I believe it... Um, the, the ferryman or something like that, mm. the boatman. Um, but, uh, you know, the weevils were, were a horrible thing. True. Then you had your salt beef, which you got two pounds twice weekly, salt pork, one pound twice weekly, dried fish, two ounces, thrice weekly, butter, two ounces, thrice weekly, cheese, four ounces, thrice weekly, peas, four ounces, now these not be, four days these not to be fresh peas, my friend. No, no, these be dried and boiled up into a mash, and they called it a peas. But it was truly just a peas porridge, almost like uh, like a gruel or a That's or right. a kind of a mashed up uh, plop that they would it was, serve. It was nasty, foul stuff. Um, and of course, now at this time, they had no idea that uh, when you boiled food, often it it took it stripped all the vitamins out of it. That's right. Um, Beer, of course, you also got one gallon a day. And on an occasion, if you were lucky on board a good ship, you might get raisins, barley meal, sugar, dried apples, or pears. And sometimes on occasion, currants, uh, tamarinds, um, sorgo, almonds, garlic, mace, and nutmeg. Yeah. This be most of what anyone could find aboard ships, you know, and they would, they would, uh, the victuallers would buy whatever they could aboard land to try to keep their, their crews healthy enough to get out of port and to keep them in fighting shape long enough to fight a battle perhaps and get back. But it was on these long voyages, you know, that uh, scurvy broke out quickly. Uh, the men were already uh, unhealthy from this terrible diet and it made it even worse that they would be stuck at sea for four, five, six months without any fresh food. But it wasn't always those at sea. There was a, a, a story of uh, a Frenchman by the name of Jacques Cartier in 1535 who was in um, near what is now Quebec City in Canada and uh, along the St. Lawrence River and it was winter time and he became quite unhealthy and he lost 25 of his men and then he had one of his men Dom, Dom Agaya who went out who they never figured they'd ever see again and Dom ran into some Iroquois Indians and when he ran into those Iroquois Indians, he came back and miraculously healed from scurvy. Hmm. Now, the thing was, it was believed and taught to them by the Iroquois that uh, Anita, or white cedar, the sap or the juice, boiled True. and settled would actually prevent scurvy. Now, it is known today that, uh, that those of you who like to do uh, survival, that um, boiling the pine uh, needles... Pine needles part of the bark is, is actually really good yeah. for uh, preventing scurvy. Now, that's one of the few times that cooking actually gets you yeah. your, uh, your food. Most of the time, cooking the food lessens the amount of vitamin C that you might get. True. Now, a thing about salt beef, and I don't want you to get this idea that a Navy seamen, of course, sat back with a big giant steak upon their plate and carved upon it and loved it up as if they'd gone to the Longhorn Steakhouse. Quite often the salted beef was so hard, it was impossible to cook or even eat. So what the cooks would do 
as they would take a great 30-40 pound slab of salt beef, tie it with a rope and throw it out behind the ship and let it sail behind the ship, let it bow in the waves and sink and, and sail in, in salt water and they would soak it through most of the day before they brought it back up and before they could cut it apart with saws and boil it up and to make this boiled meat mash which was sort of a stool right. but there was very little left in nutrition wise and essentially what the men were eating is sort of like carrion at that time. Well, they would also do it in the copper pots, and doing it in the copper pot was not healthy no. either. You can get copper poisoning from that too. And copper poisoning, which we'll find later on when we talk more about ways to make rum in various ways, uh, it would make you also sick and be metal poisoning. Now, there's a famous story of Sir John George Anson, who had six ships, and his goal was to sail from England all the way, all the way around the uh, Cape or the, the South Afri or South American tip, Cape Horn, uh, Cape Horn into uh, the Pacific to harass the Spanish and then uh, capture Spanish ships and make it back home. And he actually only made it home with one ship because uh, just before they got to the, uh, the tip of South Africa, two of his ships had to turn around and then one of them crashed and by the time he uh, he got to harass some of the Spanish towns, he had three ships, uh, one of which was a sloop, and then in the middle of the Pacific, he ended up having to burn one of his ships, which was a great loss. Now, he still managed to capture a Spanish ship with uh, a pretty good take on it, but because of scurvy, he lost almost the majority of his men. And he started off with over, over 2,000 men, and when he got back, um, he had like... 2,000 men, he had 227 or so men left out of 2,000. Now, that's quite, that's quite, a, quite loss. a loss. Yes. Now, many ships would actually, uh, if they might need 250 men, they might actually double that on, or triple that on True. board a ship because the English knew that um, the loss of life was going to be great. Now, it was a greater expense to them to lose ships than it was to, to the men. So once um, Anson lost... All those men in the ships the English Admiralty decided that you know we need to start looking into this a little bit to find out because it was such a cost to replace a ship it was not such a cost to replace a man True. and you know the Admiralty they took a close look at Anson's voyage and said you know here's something these ships were all lost because they didn't have enough men to crew them and they just barely got a Spanish ship and they just barely got back to England with all that loot and the thing was there was it was hardly any enough men to sail her because they were so sick. And they would deliberately overstaff their ships. Uh, if a complement of a ship was supposed to be 250 men, well, they would press over 500, knowing that they would have over 50% 50, 50 of an attrition rate there, most through disease, not through warfare. Now, of course, warfare you know, had, its, had its losses, True. but scurvy was far and away the biggest uh, taker of lives on board a ship, so it was quite, quite a bad thing. Ah, quite true. Now... In uh, the uh, 1700s, after George Anson's sailing, there was a, a man by the name of George, James Lind, who was a Scotchman, who uh, was a physician, and he got himself onto the Admiralty and into a British ship and went sailing with him. And his was actually one of the first times of a, a controlled experiment in medical history. It was one of the first documented controlled True. Uh, experiments in medical history. And what um, James Lind would do, would he would take men who were sick and he would put them in groups. And some of them he would, he would give them the fresh vegetables and some of them he would give them salt water, which was also believed to be a cure. And imagine that, salt drinking cost salt water because that'll kill you. And some of them he gave them a malt of wort, which was one of the recommended uh, cures for scurvy. And Lind found that giving the men fresh vegetables and fruit, uh, specifically uh, limes and lemons and oranges and things like that, actually helped cure them of scurvy. Now, scurvy is a horrible disease because your teeth fall out, you bruise, uh, broken bones will re-break. Uh, your muscles don't develop, wounds will not heal, and you become quite scrawny and, and unhealthy. True. And once you succumb to not having enough, 
it's uh you know it's a long lingering death you know worse than starving to death or, true, or you true. know not having water true so uh it was a very horrible thing to to, to catch her scurvy and uh or to catch scurvy and so lind proved what could actually possibly cure these things now the funny thing was when lind went back and uh, and started his private practice he wrote many volumes and, and revisions to his book on uh, on scurvy and as each one went he changed his story a little bit more because he was a practicing physician and he wanted to keep his business and wealth and the admiralty and those who were of high influence would uh, would would turn their noses to him until he changed his tune which you know as a doctor you don't want to lose uh, your patients and that's what was happening to him so he changed his tune and by the time of his his death he was agreeing with many people that that uh, the fruits and vegetables were not uh, the, the real cure it was the malt of wort yeah now what exactly is malt of wort well it's called wort of malt, wort actually. Of malt. no it's it's sort of like it's um it's a brewery product when they make a beer. Now, of course, during this time, everyone drink lots of beer. And it's, it's sort of like beer starter that you would make beer from. But you get a lot of wort of malt. And it's, it's sort of like uh, a industrial byproduct. Kind of what's, what's left over and what you have left over from making a big batch of beer. Well, what you do, well, it's got an alcohol content and it's got some sugar in it left over from fermentation. And typically, you know, you could drink it, but it probably wouldn't have much flavor to it. It'd just be a, a sort of a, a fermented wheat beverage that's not even close to being beer-like, uh, but uh, might have some properties of, uh, of a wheat sort of flavor. And, of course, uh, the Admiralty thinking, well, we've got lots of this stuff around from all the breweries. Um, it's cheap. Uh, you know, the lower classes like to get drunk anyway. We've got to give them an alcohol ration to keep them working hard. Uh, let's feed them this. And uh, it seemed to fit everything uh, that the Admiralty and the upper classes wanted regarding uh, dealing with the lower classes. However, one thing, of course, it didn't do. It did not cure scurvy. Now, interestingly enough, the explorer James Cook was the next person to actually start uh, almost nearly finding the cure for scurvy. True. And it's interesting in time that there was a find in scurvy and a lost in scurvy, and a find in scurvy and a lost in scurvy. And a lot of times it dealt with politics and religion. Now, um, throughout time, ships had never sailed these long, long voyages before. Most of them had sailed from port to port. And if they ever made a, a few days or a few weeks at most, true. And if they made a long, sh a long voyage, such as Ferdinand Magellan did when he went around the world, uh, he suffered terribly from scurvy. And so people looked at that and thought, well, you know, let's try to improve the lot of the sailor, feed them some fresher vegetables, some some uh, fruits and stuff, and eventually those who sailed long distances, quite often the Portuguese. Um, came up with an idea, and they didn't know exactly why this worked, but they started feeding their men uh, bits of citrus fruits, such as pineapples and oranges and limes, and they would squeeze this out, and they would put it in their food or give them a ration every day. Now, this was done on private voyages, not on military voyages. And But private captains and explorers soon learned that, well, you know, we don't know why this is working, but we'll give our, our crew some of this. And, you know, the thing is, is those uh, in control of the, of the Admiralty fleets, the, the Admiralty board and the such, didn't believe men in this state. And they didn't believe these um, explorers when they said this. And so, th when they say that the, the cure for scurvy was found and lost and then found and lost again, it's true, but it's not quite true. They didn't quite know exactly what was going on because they didn't know that scurvy is a deficiency in, in ascorbic acid. They just knew that if you fed Ben... Not citric acid. Not citric acid, not ascorbic acid. Now, they just didn't realize that if you fed sailors certain things, uh, certain sorts of fresh fruits and vegetables, that their condition would improve greatly. So they, they considered, well, let's go and do this. And now that's what Cook did. Cook, he uh, sailed uh, around the world for uh, two or three years at a time, and he could not afford to lose crew. Right, he had three voyages, and the first two were, were very successful. 
and the crew loved him, and he was uh, he treated them well, and they had fresh uh, fruits that they got in the tropics in uh, Australia and mm -hmm. in, in other places, and. His third voyage was not quite success, as successful. He started to to fall into that belief of the uh, that the fruits and vegetables were not the cure for scurvy. That there was other things. And by the time he was killed in uh, Kaikulua Bay in Hawaii, he uh, he had pretty much lost his mind, and, and his crew didn't like him, and uh, they did not uh, they, they they did not. Uh, 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 trying to think of the word here, Captain. Uh, they didn't do as well when it came to their health on the third voyage as they did on the first two. Well, now, the strain of command, I think, um, and the idea that it being an officer in this officer class, he had no true friends aboard ship. And he had no one to confide in, no one to talk to. And the strain of command got to him. And he was already an and older success. gentleman. And the need for success. And, you know, and he was under a great deal of strain. And so he be, he began to be quite of a martinet, uh, punishing his crew for no reason, uh, carrying on uh, poor relations with the natives he met, even though he had carried on excellent relations with them before. Uh, towards the, on his third voyage, well, uh, it, things weren't going so well for him, and he became quite quarrelsome and squabbish um, amongst the natives, and they killed him for it. Now, interesting enough. The uh, the man who who actually brought the true end to the uh, the scurvy was a man by the name of Gilbert uh, Blaine. Blaine Blaine Gilbert that's right. Blaine now, an English gentleman and surgeon right now up to the the point of George or Gilbert Blaine now Gilbert Blaine didn't come along until the late 1700s early 1800s and it's it's kind of a belief that the uh, the British probably would have done better. In uh, against the Americans in the American Revolution, had they not suffered so heavily upon scurvy, the Americans didn't suffer as bad as the English because you know we didn't go out on long voyages and 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 uh, uh, blockade uh, ports like the the English did. So they didn't have access to the fresh fruits and vegetables that the Americans did. Not to say that the Americans didn't suffer from scurvy; they did not get hit from it as bad, and their navy wasn't quite as big and didn't have to suffer from it. So it'd be interesting enough that had the uh, the English done more with uh, what had been found about scurvy, how they might have fared in the Revolutionary War. Now Gilbert Blaine uh, got himself in with uh, as a personal physician to Admiral Sir George um, Rodney. I have to look at my cheat sheet here. And <coughs> Sir George Rodney was was a lesser lesser admiral underneath Nelson. But uh, he he listened to Gilbert, and Gilbert suggested that uh, that uh, lemon juice, and he would put the lemon juice in bottles, and they would give that to the men. Now, kind of funny thing here. I've got some lemons for the captain and I to oh, take a suck out that. of here. Now, imagine sucking on this, mm, quite good, because uh, it's it's is good for you, and this is what. Uh, a, uh, a a man might uh, suck on. No, he doesn't want to suck on it. He likes to put it in in uh, in, in his drinks. But I will suck on it here. True. Mm. Well, it's a bit tart, but it's good. Now the captain, he he likes, like I said, he likes his. I put it in me grog where it mm. belongs. Now, interestingly enough, you know the English are called limeys. And they're called limeys because of limes. But limes don't have the amount of vitamin C that many of our other items that we have here. No. Now, there are a few things on, on our table here that don't have any vitamin C or very, very, very small traces that it really would matter. Do you know which ones they are? Well, I'm thinking probably that onion there does not have much. Well, that's not an onion, that's garlic. Oh, it looks like a giant <laughs> It looks onion. like it's onion in a way. Um, I'm thinking there, uh, well, I don't, uh, this is... So we have broccoli. Well, broccoli We have here. an avocado. Ah. We have a giant lime. Uh, that's a giant lemon. Lemon, excuse me. We have the garlic. We have the tomato. True. Or tomato. We have the pineapple. We have a smaller lemon. Mm. We have the orange and we have the yellow pepper. The pepper. True. Yeah, on this table, uh, and 
I said the lime. There's a lime there. On this table, there are three items that do not have much for vitamin C. That would be an avocado, which is actually quite good in, um, in uh, good fats and things like that. The garlic, which is great for seasoning and making your breath uh, strong garlic, and, and keeping the vampire vampires away. Mm, vampires. And the tomato. Many believe that the tomato or tomato was quite poisonous to eat. It is. I never eat them. I eat them. Now, of, of all these things here, there's things on here that we don't have that we can't get access to, but there's something called a kakadu plum, which is from Australia, which is a hundred times more vitamin C than one orange. One plum, one little plum, and it's not very big, it's only about so big. It's 530% of your daily vitamins, or it's or up to uh, 500 and um, 5,300 milligrams per 100 grams. Quite potent. So it's quite good. Then you have um, akindia cherries. Cherries, you see. It's uh, an akindia cherry. It's a little bit different. Oh, okay. It is. Uh, I can't read me me typing here, but uh, oh, 822 milligrams. That's quite a bit of uh, vitamin C. Then rose hips, that which grows on your rose bush, mm. is actually quite good. And there's people that, that make teas and things out of that. I've heard uh, they're making rose hips tea. Right. Now, rose hip has 119 milligrams um, per six rose hips. Mm. Quite true. Uh, chili peppers, one equals 109 milligrams. Well, you've got a pepper right there. That's a yellow pepper, and oh. I will get to the yellow pepper. Okay. Then you have uh, guava which one has 126 milligrams. A sweet yellow pepper, half a cup is 137 milligrams. Now, mind you, once again, this is raw. This is not cooked. When you start cooking it, it takes a lot more out True. of it. Then you have black currants. Half a cup has 10% um, of, uh, or, or 100 milligrams. Then you have thyme, which is a great a for cooking, a spice. Or an herb, an rather. Herb. An herb. One ounce is 45 milligrams. Well, even that then. That's a Parsley, lot. Parsley, that's another one. Mm. Two tablespoons, 10 milligrams. So add it up, you know, per, per its little bit, it actually is quite good. True. Then you have mustard spinach, one cup, raw, 195. Kale, one cup, 80 milligrams. Kale conquistadors, kale. Kale. Kiwi. One medium kiwi is 71 milligrams. Mm. Now there's broccoli here. Raw or steamed, you know, you, you don't want to cook it heavily. That little broccoli there, half a cup is 51 milligrams or 57% of mm. your daily uh, vitamins that you need. Brussels sprouts, now I can't stand those little cabbages. Half a cup is 49 milligrams. Just leave them, we'll leave them at home, you know. A lemon, one whole raw lemon, 83 milligrams. You know, so it's quite good. It's good, but you know, you'd have to go through quite a bit of lemon. But however, uh, you know, a, a, a steady dose of such that would be uh, a quite beneficial over time. Even a little bit is better than none. True. Uh, then you have something called lychees, which I'm not quite a, quite sure what that is. One of them is uh, seven milligrams. Hmm. The American parsimons one is uh, sixteen point five milligrams. Papaya which is a, a good fruit. One cup is 87. Strawberries. Now, we had strawberries but uh, on our ship, but uh, I, I didn't uh, bring them down here. Strawberries are one of the, the best things that you can have. One cup is 89 milligrams. One little cup of strawberries. That's great. Is 89 milligrams. And so good to eat, which too. Which is so good. The captain here likes his, his berries every day with, his, with his, his mush and oh, stuff. It's very good. Oranges. One is worth... 70 milligrams, not too bad. This pineapple, one good sized pineapple is 432.6 milligrams. Well, that, that one pineapple, now that holds a lot. But typically a person doesn't eat all well, that. Well, you wouldn't be eating a whole giant pineapple now, no. I think. But no, no. Uh, still, even a portion of it would have quite a bit. A mango, 122. Mm. Cauliflower, 283. Uh, green peppers and red peppers, 181. Mm. Uncooked Potato, yes, uncooked potato actually has 42 milligrams. Well, the problem is, of course, is that most people don't eat raw potatoes. 
No, they don't. A little potato with a little raw potato with a little bit of salt, though. I kind of I mean, like that. You can chew on it a bit, but chew on it most bit. people won't, and, and it right. does not keep. Does not keep at all. Yeah. And of course, limes, which actually only has 19.5 milligrams. So interesting enough, when they say that limes prevent uh, scurvy, it would take an awful lot of limes to prevent you from uh, from getting scurvy. Now, keep in mind, folks, that. At this time, they still looked at scurvy as a disease and not a deficiency. It wasn't until the early uh, 20th century that people, when they began to uh, break down the atomic structures of various chemicals, that they, that they came to the conclusion that actually ascorbic acid would be different from other acids and it'd be absolutely necess a, a great necessity there for a happy, healthy human life. And then they begin to realize uh, what vitamin deficiencies certainly were. And uh, up until this time, well, uh, they just gave them uh, citrus drinks, so to speak, lime juice and lemon juice, knowing that it helped, but not quite knowing exactly how or why it would help. Right. Now, we were talking a little bit about Gilbert Blaine mm. and the, uh, the giving of the juice, the lime, lemon juice, to the sailors on board of uh, Admiral Nelson's Navy during the uh, the war with the French and the Spanish and it was because of the crews on board the Navy ships now not having the scurvy that it actually allowed the uh, the English to have a crushing defeat against the French and the Spanish at Trafalgar sure. um, because the French and the Spanish were just decimated now the funny thing was the French and the Spanish actually had the fresh fruits but they just didn't know and they did always utilize them. Now, being stuck at sea during long uh, voyages and, of course, during trying to run blockades and the such, well, you know, they, they encountered the same problem as the British. That's right. Now, interestingly enough, too, scurvy is making a comeback in, uh, in our modern age. That's because of all the fast food that uh, the people eat or uh, the, uh, the lack of food in third world and developing countries. True. They don't Quite have the, uh, the vitamins and the, the fresh fruits and vegetables that we have in, uh, in the Americas or even part of Europe. Yeah. So it's quite a sad thing. Now, yeah, it's just, it's a part of poverty. It's a know. part of poverty. And even in the Americas, there, there are those who, who do get it because, you know, they eat too much fast food. And, you know, fast food is not a deer on the run that you shoot. No. Now, there's a book that, that is quite interesting to read that brought us into this episode of uh, scurvy. Now, Stephen R. Brown, a fine Canadian writer, uh, wrote this book called Scurvy. You see that there's a little picture of the lemons right there. Right. And then there's, of course, a sailing ship on there. Uh, he's done a great job researching uh, the stories of scurvy and uh, the people's attitudes towards disease and towards people in general. Now, one of the things I found very fascinating is he also talks a bit about class in here. Him being Canadian, of course, and not British, well, he would have a very interesting concept of class. It's something here in the United States that we don't actually, we don't actually see or we're actually concerned of, since you remember back in the 1780s where we kicked the, the living hell out of the class-conscious British. That's right. And we, uh, we don't let them back in now. And then again, as pirates, we didn't true. have the class either. No, we not voted, We voted our officers in. That's true. And a very important thing that he talks about here is Gilbert Blaine's class. Now, Lind and Cook were lower middle class folks who by hard work and intelligence made big and made good upon with their scientific knowledge and their drive and determination. They made big and they, they rose to important positions. However, they were always handicapped by class. Right. Where's Gilbert Blaine was, was a no, gentleman, was though. A gentleman. And they always say this, because here's, here's the story. He had friends in right high here. places, too. It says, How a surgeon, a mariner, and a gentleman solved the greatest medical mystery of the age of sail. You have how a surgeon, that would be Lind. That would be Lind, right. A mariner, that would be Cook, Captain Cook. And a gentleman solved the greatest mystery of the age of sail. Now, Blaine's position as a gentleman allowed him access to admirals aboard ships, and he could convince them with his intelligence and by saying to them, well, you know, I'm of your same class here, sir, and you know, uh, I've got an idea about what we could do, and when we go against the French in the Caribbean, what we'll do is we'll take some lemon juice with us and we'll give it to the crew, 
and would make them happy and healthy. So when we take on those, you know, those perfidious French, well, we'll defeat them. And that is exactly what happened. And so Gilbert Blaine gained a patron, and that was the admiral who he sailed That's with right. in the Caribbean. Who, later on, when uh, he brought his ideas forth uh, through uh, the, the admirals of the Navy Board, well, they listened to him. And they did so because he was a gentleman and a part of their, a part of their class. So they would listen to someone more of their class than they would to anyone else. And so uh, the story then moves on up to um, that they're in fighting the French in Nelson's Navy. And this idea then, um, where ship's captains would try to provide better food and fruit and, and victuals for their crews, and they would keep the fighting strength up on their ships, and they were fighting French ships that were grossly undermanned and, the, and unable to mount broadsides from both sides of their ships, whereas the British could because they had enough healthy sailors to do so. That's right. So, would highly recommend this book. It's, uh, it's actually what just, you know, we, we all talk about scurvy and, and scurvy dogs and, and scurvy pirates, which we're not. Quite and uh, I actually saw Captain Jack references on the video. Not, not the Captain Jack we know, but another Captain Jack we True. know. And he, uh, he highly recommended this book. He didn't go into much detail, but he said it was a good read. So I decided to pick this up. A very good and idea. It's, it's actually a very easy read and goes quite quickly. But, and you don't really want to set this book down because it's got a lot of good history in it. True. It's a very easy book. read. Very, very, very easy paced and smooth reading and doesn't insult the reader with uh, too many foreign and technical terms. It's written down to the, to the expertise of the general reader. So, highly recommend it. Sure. Now, here's one of the things that you can do to prevent scurvy friends. One, when you get your, when you get your rum, you can mix a little bit of uh, water or ice with it, and you can take yourself some lemon, or you can take yourself some lime, and give yourself a couple squirts. And I would recommend probably, what would you say, Captain, uh, a quarter of a lemon or a third of a lemon or a lime? Well, it kind of depends upon the lime. Sometimes, sure. you know, um, a lot of times, you know, you get a lime and you cut it up into either quarters or uh, eighths, and, and probably one eighth of a, of a lemon. Now, the captain here likes two to three quarters, so he, he drinks uh, usually um, three little slices, like about the size that he had there in his uh, his tea. I typically only like to drink one in mine, but... What can I EBT say? totally tired sometimes. I like not my grog full of lemons. He like us. Not, not to mention Black Bear's Pirate of Revenge, True. which has a little bit of lime in it. And that'd be necessary, of course, to keep scurvy at bay and for the captain and I on our long voyages. Now, folks, I hope you enjoyed this part, because one thing we talk about a lot on the Pirate Round is pirate history and naval history and such. And we do so because we're very interested in history. And we want to uh, present this now to all those who watch. We want to uh, educate a little bit and, sh and show you a bit of a world that perhaps you didn't know much about and you would like to learn and know about more. Now, one thing we do plan on the future is we have a good friend who's a cook by the name of Sabine. Mm, true. And Sabine has expressed an interest in coming on to uh, our episodes and uh, doing some about cooking that pirates might have had either on board ship or uh, while they were on uh, the uh, the beaches or or in the towns. And so I think we're we look going forward to, to that. I think we're going to get uh, Sabine to make us some salt beef, some cracker, uh, some gruel that we're going to sample, and we're, we're going to even some barbecue and maybe some barbacore. And we're going to uh, sample it here and give you an idea about what the mariners might have eaten and why they would have much preferred fresh, tasty vegetables over a wooden bowl full of half-eaten pea muck, uh, pea muck, pea porridge, and salted beef the water. for days. Mm -hmm. So, <clears throat> Now, if you like this episode, please subscribe and like and pass the word of the Pirate Round. <sighs> yes, uh, Take your cutlash out and stab that subscribe button and spread the word, friends. You know what we're about. We're about history. And we're about uh, presenting uh, facts and stories and legends and lore uh, around pirates and sailing and, marina and mariners. Because, you know, we believe it's very important uh, throughout history now 
that uh, that we we spread the we spread the the words and ideas and deeds and and legends of people who have who have lived in the past. And so we say to you now, friends, thank you so much for watching this episode of the Pirate Round concerning scurvy. A little bit of a longer episode. True, but we had a lot of facts to present, and it would be interesting to hear back from you what you thought about it. And so we say to you now, we're going to we're going to sign off, and we're going to tell you now. Your heart, your heart, smooth sailing, smooth sailing, and remember now, friends, you be a pirate. You don't have to take shit from no one. Stick to your guns. Stick to who you are. Always be true. Always be true to your crew. Always be yourself. Always be yourself. Which is a pirate. Which is a pirate, of course. There you go. Your heart. Your heart. Very good.